This week's episode of the Autoblog Podcast is brought to you by the Autoblog Daily Digest. It's a great way to stay updated with what's happening in the world of cars in just two or three minutes every day. Ask your smart speaker for the Autoblog Daily Digest to stay up to speed with the latest car news, or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today on the phones is Senior Editor for All Things Green, John Snyder. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing awesome. Uh, we thought it was going to be an early spring, and now it's 39 and sort of sleeting outside my house. So, so it goes. Special guest today, Contributing Editor, Joe Lorio. How are you, man? Good. How are you guys? Good, good. Excellent. Welcome to the podcast. Um, Joe does a lot of editing for the site uh, throughout the week. You probably see his byline. He does some, you know, a good deal of freelance writing for us as well. Uh, and I believe, Joe, you spent some time in the Aston Martin DBX, right? I did. Mm -hmm. um, the end of last year, cool. I was able to get into the DBX for a little while, which was a nice treat. Uh, mine was like British Racing Green, which seemed sort of appropriate. Um, and Greg, you were also in that car recently, correct? That's right. Mine was a gorgeous shade of, uh, it was just kind of like a creamy white. The inside was, uh, Aurora blue, they said, and it was $211,000. So it was, it was quite the, uh, expensive crossover, but, um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I even put a car seat in it. Uh, so we've got the, the DBX in the show. That's one of the spotlight things, but we have another crossover that costs, uh, geez, probably a uh, fourth as much, roughly, maybe <laughs> a third. That's the Audi SQ5. John drove that. I'm excited to get into that because I actually did the launch of that one back in 2017, and this is the first major update basically since then. So that'll be cool. And then we have a new long-termer at Autoblog, the Hyundai Palisade. It yeah. joined the uh, Snyder household uh, about a week ago. Mm -hmm. Very excited to see that. It's going to make uh, some road trips uh, as soon as a few days from now, but um, I cannot wait to take that up north to the UP this summer, and uh, it's a really nice vehicle. It's got a ton of uh, interesting gizmos on it. Yeah, you're going to love it, man. Uh, I'll tell you more about it, but I can tell you right now, it's, it's, it's great. I love it. Blue the dog is ready for it. She liked the Chrysler Pacifica a couple summers ago. Uh, she was not as wild about the Honda HRV we had a while, like a few years back. Just a little too small for a 60-pound golden retriever. But I feel like the Palisade, we're going to have some room for her in that. Um, so, yeah, should be good. Speaking of uh, large SUVs, Jeep Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer, uh, those vehicles were revealed last week just before uh, the podcast. So we're going to kind of briefly touch on those. Kia EV, it's the EV6. Uh, I think that's got an elegant kind of ring to it. I like it. And then BMW uh, told us a little bit about their Electric vehicle strategy. Finally, we will spend your money. We've got a great one. It's actually uh, the significant other of uh, the writer from the last podcast. So that's pretty great. Uh, Colleen and Jacob. So we're going um, just back to back here, uh, keeping it all, all, in the, all in the family here. So that's kind of fun. We'll spend my money. So let's talk about this DBX. Um, the one I drove, like I said, was $211,000. It's got that Mercedes AMG uh, V8 under the hood. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, like I said, I put my son in it. I did actually shoot a note to Aston real quick just to kind of, hey, I want to put a car seat in this, and this leather looks like it's softer than some steaks I've eaten in my life. Do you mind if I do that? And they were like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. You know, it's a crossover. Um, so, you know, by all means, uh, I did that. Uh, Joe, what did you do with the DBX when you had it uh, last winter? It sounds like you you did more crossover -y kind of things than I did. Um, I drove it just by myself, uh, upstate and back, on some uh, winding country roads, which was nice. Um, the thing that's really striking to me about the DBX, and it's something that doesn't really come across uh, in pictures, it really only in person, is how dramatic it looks. I mean, we've seen a bunch of different high-end or and sports car um, makers migrate into the crossover space, and you know we often bemoan that um, 
that move. And, uh, you know, some of with varying degrees, they've done so with varying degrees of success, I think. But I felt like the DBX uh, really looked dramatic. I felt that it really was a successful uh, interpretation of the Aston Martin design language into an SUV shape. Um, it's 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 weird to talk about styling in a in a uh, media where you're not looking at the pictures, but you know what what I noticed when it's seeing it in person that I hadn't really struck me when I was looking at pictures is the fact that it really has no bumpers. Um, look at the front of it; it's got the big Aston Martin grille, but not like comically ridiculously big. I think it's kind of sized to fit the size of the vehicle. And the leading edge of the hood, you know, the hood is very long. The leading edge of the hood is the most forward part of the car. So if you like nose it into uh, a telephone pole or something, I mean, <laughs> it's going to be the front edge of the hood that takes the hit and not any like impact absorbing bumper. And then, but that's, it's a disaster for insurance companies and for your, you know, collision repair costs, but it's what makes it look not like an ordinary crossover. And then the same is true at the rear. You look at the rear, you have that long tapering um, roof line, and it ends in that kind of really cool, uh, crisp edge shaped that's traced by the taillights. And that trailing edge, again, is the furthest out piece of bodywork. There's no like bumper that ex that extends beyond it. So again, you know, uh, be very, very careful parking, but uh, boy, it looks good um, in the flesh. I would agree with that. I think it looks, um, to your point, Joe, way better in the flesh than I really expected. You know, you look at the pictures, the press photos, and they really don't do it justice. I was actually just trying to drop a couple of pictures I snapped here into our, our chat here. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually didn't notice that until your point there about there really are no bumpers, but I, I was basically staring at that, that grill, uh, like when it was sitting in my driveway. And it has, to me, it, just look at that like sort of rectangle, if you will, of the grill and the headlights. That's an Aston Martin to me. You know, as you flow farther back, you know, naturally it's it's a crossover, but this is, I think, the first sort of crossover from a something that isn't traditionally a crossover, like a Porsche, or I was recently in the Mach E, that I think really, really successfully translated like what the brand should be as a crossover. And where I think they That's exactly it. That's exactly it. They really stuck the landing, I think, um, like at the back of the car with those dramatic tail lights and it's it's almost like a tail on the car which i think is really cool looking um so i think they you know just from a design perspective you gotta it's tricky with these things like i honestly thought the mach e didn't hold up as well as a crossover in the back in my conclusion what that car was it doesn't really matter because it's an electric vehicle it does all these things for ford um you know i drove the id4 which is kind of a separate thing but that's totally a microwave crossover you know, we've all driven like the Macan and the Cayenne, and those are fairly conventional crossovers right now, aside from the taillights and the, the slightly curved fenders in the back. I mean, Aston Martin, they really went like bumper to bumper, list bumpers, if you will, to okay. make this thing affect what it should be. Even more than I would say like the Bentayga, um, which I haven't driven, but I have I've obviously seen it. So, you know. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. And uh, it extends to the interior as well. I mean, it's it's a useful interior. I mean, you put a car seat in it. Um, it has decent back seat room. It has good space up front. But, you know, you, you get into it, you're, you're, you're opening the door with that flush, uh, flush mounted, smooth door handle. You open the door, you see it's frameless door glass, you know. So even just the act of getting in, there's a little bit of that kind of Aston Martin sort of, I want to say theater, but like the feeling of you're getting into something kind of exotic, even though it's this practical shape. And then you get inside and you're just hit with that wave of leather smell. <laughs> it's like walking into like a really good shoe store or something. 
it's it's really a it's a it's a snootful, and um, it sets a tone. There's just leather everywhere. You said your car was blue inside. Mine was like kind of classic orangey tan leather color. So I think that really helps kind of drive the point home. And of course, the whole dash is covered with leather, and uh, it just feels so great and smells so great inside there. Um, it gives you that a real Aston Martin feeling, I think. I, yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a good point, too, in the fact that they managed to pull off an, exp- an interior that I think looks really expensive. It feels really expensive with, you know, again, mine was Aurora Blue with kind of like a tan headliner. And then this very light um, veneer, <clears throat> like accents by the shifter and the center console and all that stuff, or the center console. And it was like understated, but also like not. Like when your interior is blue i mean that that really kind of hits you in the face but it was i would say more understated compared to say some mercedes and bmws cadillacs you get all this carbon fiber this really over the top leather you know ambient light pipes coming at you every which way this was just like oh wow that's like a really nice leather interior and it's all leather so that was good um you know, I was very careful with this car as far as like, you know, I mean, just, you know, you carefully use the hand sanitizer. You don't want to like, you know, get any like hundred proof, you know, anti back on these seats or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, inside and out, it was beautiful. And the second row was pretty usable, you know, getting my son in and out of it. I didn't have any problems. I mean, it's, it was definitely better than many crossovers i've used at a variety of price points you know you go back to that minivan gold standard and then work your way away from that it wasn't bad you know it wasn't great like any styled up crossover would be but i didn't hit my head which is saying something and how did you feel about the fact that it uses a like mercedes-benz interface for the infotainment and that kind of thing i was okay in my mind or go ahead well, I was say I was okay with that to be honest, because um, I don't personally look to Aston Martin to have proficiency in that area. I realize that, you know, I mean, they kind of have to make do with what they can, and if the best they could do is Mercedes, I'm I'm okay with that. You know, I think is somebody who like tries to study the business and knows that AMG and Aston have that kind of alliance and i think there's an ownership stake even uh involving you know mercedes and daimler with aston like i'm okay with that i i mean personally i didn't actually love the infotainment system but i didn't not like it because it was like a mercedes i just the infotainment system in whatever execution it's in i'm not the biggest fan of it although it was pretty usable it was fine it was better than say like acura's newest system let me put it that way but what do you think i'm sorry i cut you off um, I have no problem with the Mercedes system. I think it's pretty user friendly. I kind of like having a wheel rather than only a touch screen. I think for you know making inputs on the go, it kind of allows you to do stuff a little bit more with your eyes still on the road. So you know, I was happy to see it there, and I thought it worked well. And like you, I kind of understand that you know it's not necessary for these really small volume manufacturers to reinvent the wheel in something as prosaic as an infotainment system. I, you know, I really enjoyed the car um, overall. It actually is one of the, I'd say like high performance SUVs that also, you know, it it felt pretty quick uh, to me. It, uh, it handled well. The Mercedes engine was pretty quick and strong. Um, You know, the transmission was good. Like, I mean, I will say this, when you start to think about, to get really like meta here, you know, you need a crossover, like you're rich, you know, at this point, what do you want? And maybe you're not even comparing like, you know, abilities and characteristics of the car. You're just like, what do you want? And this is where you start to me think about like G-Class, probably your cross shopping, um, you know, Bentayga. John, have you driven the Bentayga? I have not. Okay. You were in like an X7 Alpina or something, weren't you? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I was. I was in that and I was in the uh, Mercedes Maybach GLS 600. Oh, geez. uh, Okay. In the last last couple months. (laughs) 
all of those kind of apply to this field. You know, I mean, you are talking about differences of tens of thousands of dollars. But again, if if that's your rounding error, you probably don't care, you know. So, um, you know, I mean, even if you wanted to really, really load up a Defender or something like that, just because that Range Rover, Range Rover, exactly. You know, there's a lot of things in this segment, give or take a hundred grand, um, which is kind of a funny thing to say. I mean, that would be my <laughs> criticism of this, though, is like, let's just say you really are an Aston Martin customer and you need a crossover to use the almost like the analogy or comparison that Subaru always said was, well, we're losing all our buyers because we don't have a three row crossover. Now this allows them as their family grows. You know, I don't know. Does Tom Brady really like, geez, I, 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 I've been Aston Martin spokesman and I'm just, I'm out of options in the Aston family. Now I got to go buy something else. Like, I don't really know how much of a real use case that is where the Aston buyer needs a crossover, but I mean, they got to be there. I think at the end of the day, they need a crossover. And I think this is uh, executed better than many of their um, like colleagues have done across the industry. Um, yeah. I mean, it was fun. Yeah. I thought it was really executed well. And uh, like you, I really enjoyed driving it. I mean, certainly that uh, four liter, uh, you know, 542 horsepower Mercedes V8 is like, that's, uh, that's plenty for most people. And uh, the eight speed automatic is super, or that automatic is super polished. Um, and the, you know, they're able to preserve an athletic uh, re uh, response, handling and, and steering without going super, super stiff with the ride, which you sometimes see with these really sporty SUVs. Um, at the end of the day, though, I mean, as much as I admired the DBX, I had it also it also brought to mind a uh, uh, vantage convertible I'd driven like earlier in the fall, and I was like, you know, as much as I like the DBS, I would still rather drive, um, you know, the the convertible sports car. But uh, that's always going to be the case. So um, all that said, I thought it was a super well executed and a real surprise. I do think to sort of put the other side of my own argument here. If I were in the market for a really expensive SUV and I perhaps was an Aston Martin loyalist, I would get, you know, the DB11 or the Vantage or something. And then I would just load up an Escalade or load up. I actually have a Chevy Suburban in my driveway right now. That's basically awesome in every way you need a large SUV to be. I would just go ahead and get the biggest, like, you know, troop transporter of an SUV and do that rather than probably do it this way and then have my driving enjoyment be in my DB11 and then have my, you know, family responsibilities in the Escalade or the Defender or whatnot. Or Range Rover. Or you're Range probably Rover. a Brit. You're probably an Anglophile, really. So you might want to keep it in the Great Britain family. That's true. Family. Yeah. Cool. So that's the DBX. Uh, let's, I guess, cross over to the continent and talk about the SQ5, John. Mm -hmm. um, how much did this thing cost? I guess we're dropping down tax brackets a little bit, but um... so so this one, it, the it starts at uh, fifty two nine before the uh, one thousand dollar destination charge, but this one was uh, optioned up to uh, seven, like almost seventy two grand. Um, which feels like a lot to pay for a, a, a Q5, essentially, you know. Um, but that said, it had, you know, it had like the adaptive suspension and all those goodies. And so it drove really, really well. Um, it, it didn't feel quite as hot as after coming out of, you know, the SQ8 um, a couple months ago. But uh, it's a little more sane than that, um, a little more practical. But, um, yeah, it was it was it was really nice to drive. Very sort of car like in its driving. Um, uh, the the three liter uh, V six, um, you know, it's very quick, uh, but it doesn't necessarily feel super quick because it's it's very smooth and it, it's it's all it's handling all the power in a very calm way. So it'll dash to sixty in I think four and a half seconds. Uh, four points, four point 
4.5, 4.7, something like that. Um, 4.7. And, um, and, and while that's, you know, you can blow the doors off of, you know, everyone else taking their kid to, to preschool. Um, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel too rambunctious. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a nice car to drive. The, having the, um, the S, uh, S tune suspension really helps quite a bit. Um, especially with, uh, you know, those, those, uh, 21 inch wheels on it. Um, it just adapts really well to the, to the conditions, to whatever, you know, sort of driving you're doing. Um, whether you're, uh, you know, driving calmly, going to get groceries with kids in the car, or you want to take it out on some of your back roads and, and open it up. Um, it's really good at both those things, which I, I, I seems to be sort of Audi's, um, MO. I, I was in the, you know, a four, a few weeks back and it's an, it's another one of those cars where it's just, um, sort of a dual nature, uh, really good at, at being a comfortable, calm commuter and then, you know, <laughs> letting loose when, when you want to with the, you know, hit the, hit the, uh, drive mode button and start using the paddle shifters and have some fun. Yeah. It's, uh, this is one of the first significant like updates for the SQ five in a few years. Um, I actually did the launch, uh, back in 17 in the spring, uh, up in British Columbia. And, um, you know, different time, somewhat different vehicle. Um, but it, it sounds like the, the ethos of the car really kind of carry over, uh, if you will, to what, you know, what you're saying there, John. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's obviously going to be a big volume play for them. When I look at the lineup of like the Q5s, if you will, the plug-in Q5 yeah. is really a, intriguing to me because you get actually better performance and then you can plug it in, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that to me is kind of, I think the one I would look at just from a like personal perspective. Um, but from a raw performance perspective, you know, for some people, they're going to want the S like badging and some of the yeah. treatments and the looks and like, to your point, the suspension. Uh, so I totally get that. And I mean, like the S crossovers and sedans, I think really have good dialed in dynamics as far as the brakes and the steering and things like that. So uh, it sounds like that came through on this one. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's just very, very stable. Um, not a lot of body roll. Um, doesn't really get upset uh, over, you know, the the myriad potholes um, on the roads around here. Um, the steering is, is very precise and, uh, you know, it, it weights up nicely and, and, you know, you can sort of tune everything to how you, how you want it if you don't want to uh stick with the uh pre prescribed um modes within the sport mode or comfort or whatever you can pick and choose um which is great um but yeah like you said i would i would go with a plug in hybrid um again you get you get you know most of this performance um it's maybe not quite as uh it probably doesn't handle quite as well as this one but um but again, it's you know it's it's still very like very comfortable. Um, the thing about the 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 plug-in hybrid is that it's sort of you can it's easy to forget that that car is a plug-in at all, and it just feels like a normal um, you know internal combustion vehicle most of the time. Um, you do you know get a little bit of uh, it, you know that that early torque um, sort of lets you know, and, and you can sometimes hear a little bit of the, the electric motor, but, um, but for the most part, it just feels like uh, driving a, a normal internal combustion vehicle. Um, kind of like how uh, the Audi e-tron is too. It, it's, it, it's an EV that's like clearly an EV it's, it's quiet and everything, but it's Audi doesn't seem to go out of its way to make its EVs. Um, feel specifically like an ev they, they feel like an audi first and then maybe an ev second they want to have it feel familiar um uh, which you know it's an okay move um i personally would like a little more uh stand out from my plug-in vehicles i want to i want to know that i'm driving an ev or a, or a plug-in hybrid um 
but anyway, I would still, I would still, yeah, I would go with the the plug in hybrid as my as my first choice. But the SQ five is is perfect for you know someone who wants the you know more aggressive looks and yeah the <laughs> all the different um, you know handling options you can get for it. Kind of like the base Q fives, just more like kind of vertical grill and just mm-hmm. kind of cleaner looks than the S line. I feel like Audis are getting a little overstyled these days, a even just you know. Even just in the few years since I drove the last one, but um, you know, it, design. Uh, geez, I remember there was a good quote from Ralph Gilles, who's the head of design for Stellantis, and he said, "You know, design is timeless. Good design is timeless. Bad design is timeless. It's still bad design." <laughs> and I feel like that's sort of how uh, Mercedes and Audi and BMW too, especially, have been really going through this period of like. I would call it overwrought styling, a lot of curves, a lot of like mm. excess lines, all sorts of things going on with the fascias. Um, and it's, it's fine. You know, the cars don't look plain like they did, you know, you know, years ago, but there's a lot going on there. And I think if to really kind of go off on a tangent here, I think Cadillac's look with like the, uh, the CT4, or the CT5 is dressed up and clean toned down considerably from where they were like with the last generations of like you know the cts for example but um you know i think it's i feel like the mercedes and audi and uh bmw like block if you will has gone a little farther um to the other side of that so I, yeah audi, audi is uh has shown a bit more restraint than than the other two um especially inside um, yeah inside the audi it's it's very very clean um very you know uh you know sort of modernist i would say almost um a lot of clean lines you know not a lot of extra uh uh curves or you know it, no design for the sake of design it's 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 simple and it's uh sort of architectural and i i, I like that i like that quite a bit um uh you know i do enjoy the some of the uh, Mercedes features, uh, BMW uh, can be a little over the top. <laughs> it's I, I once had a, a boss describe a BMW interior as designy. I mean, the knobs are all like different textures, and um, and, and it's it's still the case. The, the BMW just really. Um, really over designs the the interiors in my opinion and audi i mean you can tell they put a lot of thought into it but it's just uh, you know very very clean well let's do a bit of a fade here to the hyundai palisade the latest addition to the autoblog log term fleet um i believe joe you've driven one as well and we're pretty excited to add this to the fleet here so for those of you scoring at home the autoblog log term fleet is the acura tlx which joined in January that replaced the Volvo S60. Um, we're having a lot of fun with the Acura already. It actually arrived in my driveway, and then um, it's now passed over to road test editor Zach Palmer. John, you get the first crack at the Palisade. Uh, what did we get? I honestly don't know. What did we get? We got the uh, uh, calligraphy all-wheel drive. So the calligraphy is, uh, is uh, a trim level that they tacked on the top of the lineup that has... Um, it's basically the the uh, was it the signature with um, is that what it's called? Uh, it's it's the top trim level plus you know some, some uh, exclusive wheels, um, you know some uh, little trim bits here and there. Um, but so basically, the quilted the, leather. Yeah, yep, yeah, the quilted leather. This has a, a sort of Viper suede headliner. Yes, it's really really nice. This one has sort of a uh, fake birch plastic trim, which um, not sure if I'm in love with it yet. Uh, I know my, my wife isn't a fan of it, um, but in all, I think it comes together nicely. Um, the exterior. I think you guys are. Go ahead. You no, know, I think you guys are going to love uh, the Palisade as a long termer. Um, I drove. I had one a while ago, and I took it on a road trip from New York to Michigan and back. And uh, 
I anticipate you guys will be doing a lot of road trips with that thing. I think it's a fantastic uh, loaded up long distance road trip machine. Uh, if you have the calligraphy, that means that you also have highway driving assist. Yes. That's on some of the lower trims as well, but that's like a, I think it's a really, really well executed um, kind of semi automated steering system for your cruise control. And I was able to use it for uh, hours on end on I-80, some of the kind of straighter big interstates. Uh, on some of the windier highways, like uh, New York 17, it needed a little more minding, but uh, generally it does a great job. It won't do lane changes like uh, the BMW and Mercedes and some of these other ones will, but um, you know, as long as you're, you have to do your own lane changes. But other than that, I think it, it does. A, it's a really nice. It doesn't ping pong back and forth between the lanes. Uh, of course, you know, it, it's got tons of space inside. Um, including behind the third row seat is pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you, you may have noticed already, but lift up the cargo floor. It like it lifts up and then underneath there's a quite a big bay underneath. So even if you think like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get everything in here <laughs> behind this third seat, you, there's a sort of a hidden compartment there that's actually pretty sizable. Um, and I, I thought that the infotainment system, you, you've got the larger infotainment screen, the 10.3 inch one. So you can see three displays, three functions at once uh, if you wanted to, which is pretty useful. And then we were able to um, connect two phones at the same time. So like oh, that's cool. my phone could be the one for, as a driver, could be the one for phone calls, you know, in case somebody called me. But then my wife's phone has better music on it so she's plugged in and then we play the music off of her phone so that's really uh, neat. sort of yeah the ability to to um run both of those at the same time i thought was another kind of neat feature well that's very we're gonna we're gonna have to take advantage of that we, we're we're driving down to the outer banks of north carolina um in you know a week and a half and <laughs> with with two kids and two dogs in the car so it should be fun um but yeah, that's a neat feature. Um, to piggyback on what you said about the the assisted driving, it is really it's one of the better systems I've used. Um, it it the lane centering is is very very precise. I feel like, um, and yes, it, in some of the the, the uh, steeper curves on the highway, you do have to give it a little nudge. Um, but you know when it's straight or even, you know, slightly curvy, it, it really follows the lanes really, really well. Um, it's a great system. And then, and then this has the, you know, the camera feeds for the blind spots when you use the signal, the turn signal, which is um, just a wonderful feature, a really good peace of mind when, when you're you know, making lane changes in traffic or even, even when I'm turning into uh my son's school parking lot, you know, I could sort of see the curb and know I'm not going to curb a wheel. Um, it's sort of a tight little driveway there. So, um, yeah, it's, and it, it's been, uh, really, really pleasant to drive so far. And the use of space is fantastic. The, yeah, that rear cargo space behind the third row, um, is, is bigger than you see in, in most three rows. Usually, you know, you can, fit like a couple grocery bags behind a behind a third row seat um this you can fit quite a bit more um and those seats uh they go up and down electronically there's you know buttons in the back and so you just hit one of those and it folds flat um you know fighting with different levers or or you know pull ropes to to try and um get it in place it just does it for you um very very nice, um, and yeah, that 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 quilted leather is is a nice touch. It really feels like um, a higher end vehicle than you would expect. Um, this one, uh, the sticker on it is forty nine two two five, which is kind of a lot, but considering you know the size of the vehicle and the amount of, which is it's packed with content. It's got everything. Um, it just feels really, really nice. I would 
I would put this up against, you know, luxury, <laughs> luxury brands any day. Um, yeah. And, and the, the infotainment is, it, it works well. Uh, that just, dis, that displays is crisp. Some of the, if you are using the touch touch screen, it's pretty wide. So you have to reach pretty far for some of the, some of the controls, but, um, everything's laid out cleanly um yeah i'm looking forward to to driving it uh for multiple multiple hours on end <laughs> one thing that blew me away the last time i drove a palisade um which was sometime last year was this is the first time hyundai has really attempted a vehicle like this a large three-row crossover uh that's has all of these things and competes at this size um and it's really good you know, uh, well, it does kind of follow in the tire tracks of like the Santa Fe XL or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there was the Veracruz years ago, but oh, geez, they're, yeah. they're just not on the same level as this thing. I mean, it's, it's just such a better execution. Um, you know, those were so easily forgettable. And, and, and this is really kind of a standout in its, in its field. And a lot of like what you're talking about, John, with the power folding third row seats and stuff and you know the 360 degree view camera and the blind spot view monitor which besides on the highway another great use case for that really is if you're in a urban area like maybe you're in downtown ann arbor or in detroit mm -hmm. or someplace and there's in the summertime there's a lot of cyclists yeah. around you're sitting at a light you're waiting to turn you've got your signal on you know normally you would not be aware of a cyclist coming up on your right along the curbside and here like you see it in the screen you know, mm -hmm. it's it's such a great um, way to have awareness of that, you know. So, and it's got, like you said, it's got all these high-end features, and that really kind of puts it um, in a field with, with other, with premium brand products, and that's what sort of makes the price, even at the upper, in the very upper 40s, seem not that, it seemed quite reasonable. Mm -hmm. This Seems is like actually a good deal. Yeah, this is actually uh, maybe not the calligraphy trim, but the Palisade is on the maybe sort of at the top of the short list of uh, cars my my wife wants to get. To she has a, a an old Mercedes GLK diesel, and now that we have two children, um, uh, it gets pretty cramped when we go up north. Um, so this is this is. Uh, this road trip will sort of be the test to see, but we, we might end up with um, one very similar to the one that's in our driveway right now. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, even the same color. She, she wants that. It's like a sort of, uh, it's called moonlight cloud. It's almost like a dark navy blue. Um, really. Oh, that's really a nice color. Yeah. yeah. What? Um, okay. Uh, so Palisade or Telluride question for the group, if you had your choice. You know, I personally like the Telluride design a little better. I mean, it's a little more, uh, looks a little more like a rugged off-roader, whereas this looks more like a suburban uh, you know, family vehicle. They, bo they both look great. Um, I believe the Palisade has a little bit more uh, uh, rear storage than the than the Telluride. Um, but I mean, really, sort of take your pick. But if if buying something made in America is really important to you, um, the Telluride is made here in America, uh, while the uh, Palisades made in Korea. Um, but really, I mean, there's there's not a lot different in the way these these drive or in the uh, available content. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, it's it's really down to a matter of personal preference, which actually almost speaks to the sort of weird um, brand sort of parallelism between Hyundai and Kia. You know, like they haven't really defined what makes something a Hyundai versus what makes it a Kia, but that's sort of an issue for them to figure out. Um, in this case, my vote is going to go over the Telluride, mostly for the same reason you said. I just kind of like the sort of squared off utilitarian look of it better. It's just Sort of my personal preference for one of those kind of vehicles, and I also like the fact that it has a regular gear shifter rather than an array of push buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, um, didn't think of that. That's like a kind of a personal pet peeve of mine against like kind of weirdo gear shifters. 
So um, there's not much other reason to pick one or the other. So that it, you know, I'll, I'm going to pick it just for those two kind of uh, minor reasons. Interesting. I really flip a coin on this one. I originally went Telluride, then I like kind of waffled and went back to Palisade. I'm going to go Palisade just to go different here and just to be contrarian. Although I think my actual preference broad picture is the Telluride, but just right now my mood is Palisade. Uh, and I did actually randomly go to that Telluride factory way back. Uh, I think before they made Tellurides, it was on an Optima drive. They made us drive all the way I forget where we were, but it was like a five-hour drive to go see the factory, which is cool. That's great to get that kind of context. But, man, that was a long drive in a Kia Optima. Um, is, that, is that the one in, uh, is it in Georgia or Alabama? It, it's like West Point, Georgia, I think, if I'm Yeah, I, I, I believe I went right. there, too, when, when uh, the you know, previous or maybe two generations ago, uh, Sorrento, uh, was was coming out toward that factory that's very random we may have been on that same press trip at that <laughs> no time. i was on that trip with uh jeremy uh, jeremy Korsen okay Whiskey. well i would uh, have been for auto week at that time so i would not oh, it's possible yeah, yeah. all three of us were there i don't know <laughs> um on that note let's transition to some news from the present decade um we'll kind of run through the segment here pretty quick a uh, couple EVs, but first let's rehash the Jeep Wagoneer slash Grand Wagoneer from last week. Um, real quick, just initial impressions. What do you think, Joe? You know, I'm a super fan of the classic Grand Wagoneer. And so I've been waiting for this thing to, sh- to come for like a long, long time. I mean, uh, Stellantis slash FCA, should, has, they've been promising a new Grand Wagoneer for going back to like the, I don't know, at least like 2014, if not yep. sooner, if not earlier. And it's like, I can't believe it took this long, particularly in a segment where the margins are so rich. You would think that they would want to, uh, you know, get this thing out the door and into showrooms. I, you know, I think the styling of it is okay. Uh, I would have liked to have seen thinner pillars. I, the, I'm kind of off, put off by how thick the like the B and C and pillars are. I sort of like the upright squareness of it. I think the grill is fine. Um, but what's a little bit weird to me is sort of the positioning. I mean, first of all, it has no Jeep badges because they're going to make Wagoneer its own sub-brand. And yet Wagoneer is really kind of stands for the biggest Jeep. So how is it going to be a sub-brand? Are they going to make little baby Wagoneers and then that would compete with regular Jeeps? Um, It's hard to see what that path forward is there, but I guess they have some plan. And then who else thinks that maybe Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer, they're both going to have um, longer versions, sort of like Suburbans as to the current Tahoe. So there'll be like a Wagoneer L, presumably, and a Grand Wagoneer L. And then the division between Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer is one of fanciness. It, it seems to me that it would have been kind of easier for people to follow if the Grand Wagoneer was the standard wheelbase, or the regular Wagoneer was the standard wheelbase one, and the Grand Wagoneer was the suburban-sized extra-long one. And then you could just have you know, trim levels and ascending um, hierarchy of trim levels within each one of those models. So that's, I think that's a little kind of weird to follow. Um, so those are sort of my initial thoughts. I'm a little confused by that part of it, just like what you said, Joe, like just trying to like dissect which one is which and where they fit and which one has all the good stuff on it and which one is a little bit smaller. It's, it's a little confusing. And I think it's a little frustrating because one, again, to your point, Joe, I remember uh, Sergio Marchionne said this at the Detroit auto show back in 12, 13, 14, talking about this vehicle. And he was totally like going off script here and just talking about it. Everybody's quoting him in the, PR guys probably lost their minds because they're like, well, yeah, he just previewed our new SUV that we're not going to build for 10 years, but it's been out there and they had a long chance to 
a long opportunity here to get this right. And I feel like they're overthinking it. You know, they're trying to do too much. I totally don't think making Wagoneer a sub brand is a good idea. That to me is like stretching it too far. When to me, the Jeep brand is great. That's all you need. I mean, that yeah. to me is the selling point for this against Chevy and Ford is okay. A Tahoe is a Tahoe, you know, especially in Michigan. They're so ubiquitous suburbans, you know, the Yukon, the Yukon XL. I mean, obviously when you get one in real life, the GM and Ford products are very, very good. and even feel very premium. Like I said, the suburban I'm rolling around in this week, I love. It's awesome. But but that's all so maybe because I love big cars and that sort of thing, big SUVs. Uh, point being is Jeep can be a point of differentiation here. I mean, it's a Jeep. It's cool. And if you look at the front end, I think they, they get that part of the design right. But then... I will literally just say, echo everything Joe said. It falls apart when you start to go farther back with this like like troop transporter cage of the back that I don't, it's whatever. Maybe it'll look better in real life. Um, <laughs> and then again, the trims and the model lineup, way, I think, overthinking it here, uh, trying to do too much. Um, yeah. What do you think, John? Well, I think if if they're trying to do the luxury thing here, um, I, I think yes, the, the the design could have used a little bit more refinement. Um, I, I agree that the front, I'm I'm getting used to the front of it, <laughs> and uh, I, I like it. I think, uh, <laughs> but yeah, as you as you move rearward, it, like you said, those those pillars and those windows and the and the belt line, it's um, it's like they didn't put enough time into uh, making it look as premium as as they're trying to make this car be. Um, and I, I, yeah, this is going to, it's going to take a while because I've had this idea in my mind of, of the Grand Wagoneer since I was a kid, but my, my dad had one, uh, when I was, uh, very young. Um, and, uh, I don't know, th this is, it's really different than anything else Jeep has ever done. Um, especially in terms of the interior and, and the, the technology and the, uh, the, the levels. Screens. That, yes. Yeah. So many screens. So many. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see if, if they do make, you know, follow through on making Wagoneer, uh, its own sub brand. Uh, I think that would likely look like, you know, the, the luxury sub, uh, luxury brand of Jeep. Um, but yeah, I don't think that's necessary at all. Um, just I don't know, offer uh, higher trim levels in the in the Jeeps you already have. Um, but uh, you know, I, I I don't want to criticize it too much until I actually get in it because I, some of these features look uh, super inter interesting. Like the the screen on the on the passenger side that that could be useful. Um, it depends on how you know responsive they are, how uh, <laughs> how well the menus are laid out, and things like that. Um, the controls, the user interface. Uh, so I'm 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 gonna uh, sort of cheat here a little bit and withhold uh, judgment. Um, frankly, because I'm still you know <laughs> still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, I, I've you know spent a lot of time just sort of staring at at these photos and. And um, I don't know, it, and and the the prices on it, like the the grand the Grand Wagoneer starts at you know almost ninety thousand, which is hard to hard to fathom. <laughs> but uh, we'll see we'll see how it uh, how it shakes out against you know like the Escalade and, and whatnot. But um, I I do look forward to driving it. I, I will say that much. I wish there was a plug-in hybrid version. I I agree with you, John, that I feel like once I drive one of these things, I probably will like it very much. Yeah. I think that's just inevitably how, especially given my, you know, uh, like I like large SUVs that are um, capable and have a lot of things on them. I mean, honestly, who doesn't, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that. But, you know, look 10 years down the line. We always hear rumors about a Jeep spinoff. Jeep had its own luxury brand. Well, how much more valuable would Jeep in of itself be if 
Wagoneer was like maybe three, four vehicle lineup um, with like, you know, Joe's uh, baby Wagoneers dropped in there, you know, expensive ones that are like, I don't know, uh, GLA fighters. Um, man, I don't know. We need to call up one of our artists to do some red rigs here, the future Wagoneer yeah. luxury brand. But I mean, that is one way to like think three moves ahead. Maybe that's what they're thinking. Or is the idea that the top end version of some of these other Jeeps is the Wagoneer version? So mm. you have like, like you did at the very beginning of the Grand Cherokee, the, they had the wood sided one that was the Wagoneer. I mean, maybe you'd go back to that instead of the Grand Cherokee, you know, limited um, summit, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, the top one now is the Grand Cherokee Wagoneer, and the top Cherokee is the Cherokee Wagoneer, and the top Compass is the Compass Wagoneer. Well, I mean, I don't know how far you can take it down, but uh, maybe that's the thinking instead of separate additional models, but I don't really know. I actually think the wagon, it, it could be, I don't know. I mean, at this point, we're really spitballing. I think, I actually think they're really changing the Wagoneer meaning too, to go back to like what you mentioned there, John, the Wagoneer yeah. that, you know, your dad had. It's like, I don't know. I mean, the Wagoneer was never just some like real cheap thing. I mean, it always had some, you know, attainability, some aspirational qualities. But yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like they're they're messing with the meaning of Wagoneer a little bit more than I almost like. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, you know, today's dollars, that means something different. Um, I don't know. I guess I was less worried when Chevy rolled out the Blazer and slapped it on a midsize crossover with a flashy grill and people were like oh the blazer it's like well okay whatever they gotta put a name on a crossover here you go they're gonna play the hands that they have the cars that they have i don't know wagon ear again because there's so much of a build-up and it's a jeep like you know there's a lot of things that go into this that make it a little more um fraught i think potentially uh with you know how this plays out and you know maybe they'll nail it you know give it a couple years and they'll get it all right. Um, Mercedes and BMW, who seem to be the brands that we're criticizing a lot in this podcast without having actually driven them recently, um, have done a lot of things with AMG and M and changed the meaning of them. And it's, it is inevitably kind of turning out okay. Uh, it just took them a while to get the translations right. So, mm -hmm. so speaking of BMW, John, why don't you take us through these electrics that they're unveiling? Sure. Yeah, they just unveiled uh, a pair of electric vehicles, the um, the i4, which is uh, essentially an electric 3 Series, um, and then the iX, which is kind of this weird-looking <laughs> um, crossover, um, and there's going to be a lot more on the way. Um, BMW says... Uh, there's going to be um, electric uh, 5 series, uh, an electric 7 series, electric X1, um, probably about when those next generation of those cars are, are, are coming around. Um, but yeah, and, and uh, BMW says about 50% uh, of its sales will be uh, EVs by 2030. Um, which isn't quite as ambitious as some other brands, but um, I, I think uh, you know, BMW customers do appreciate the uh, the uh, gas burning engines in those. So it, it, I don't know if uh, the ditching the ICE uh, strategy would would work as well for um, BMW, but they are going that route with Mini. Um, by mint uh, by 2030, um, all minis will be electric, um, and the last gas-powered mini will be launched in uh, 2025. Um, don't know what it'll be, but um, but then yeah, from then on, um, they're releasing EVs until it's all EVs, and um, so we're we're starting to see the beginning of of that now. Um, but yeah, the uh, the i four we don't have a lot of of specs on it yet. Um, we do know that uh, the uh, top range will be about three hundred miles on a charge, um, and 
a 530 horsepower uh, version will uh, do zero to 60 in about four seconds. So <laughs> it'll be quick, um, but I'm sure, you know, they're going to have multiple variants uh, with multiple uh, outputs and motor configurations. Um, and the i4 will be uh, coming, um, it, it says 2022 model year, so uh, whatever that means. Um, the iX, <laughs> uh, and you got to look at this thing. It's, 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 it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it will be here, um, later this, later this year, they're beginning production and it'll be here, um, uh, delivery starting in, uh, uh, about a year from now. Um, but, uh, yeah, this, this crossover, it's um, uh, it's it's kind of funky looking. Uh, it's got that big, huge grill. It sort of looks like the um, the I next. Uh, it's basically uh, 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 picking up that ball and carrying it. Um, and uh, yeah, not a lot of features, uh, not a lot of uh, information about that yet either um uh it will have all-wheel drive with uh, two electric motors and um up to 500 horsepower <laughs> um and uh we'll do zero to 60 in under five seconds um so again that'll be a, a quick one um but yeah uh interested to really interested to to uh, get behind the wheel of this this IX because um, it's just sort of bizarre looking. <laughs> it's pretty wild looking. You're right. I think um, I think it's just interesting to see BMW sort of really um, like really get into EVs at this point, at least publicly, and chart what their path is going to be. I mean, they were pretty willing to like look at internal combustion engines and diesels for quite some time, and I think. Um, Obviously, they've been working on this electrification strategy for a bit. I mean, they did have the iCars, which they put front and center before a lot of people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the i8 and the i3. Mm -hmm. The i3 was pretty wild and weird. But, um, yeah, both of, both of those cars were pretty out there, especially for, yeah. for then. And so they've been kind of like playing both ends, if you will. Almost like, I don't want to say ignoring climate change, but they were like, you know, looking at other like, hey, we're going to keep these traditional things. But mm -hmm. also, we're doing all these other things that other people are doing. So, kind of a, you know, incongruent approach. But I think they're kind of, you know, figuring out what their path is. And I mean, I think they're also sort of getting their story right as we look at like, you know, geopolitical winds and what's going on here. Like, you know, they're they're definitely getting the right messaging out with these these kinds of cars. Um, so we'll see. We, we shall see. EV six. Quick thoughts to the room here from Kia. I'm getting some. Uh, I know it's it's you know a completely different vehicle, but I'm getting some uh, Kia Soul vibes from the the greenhouse of it. Um, it's another one that we don't have a lot of information about, but uh, it's on the uh, 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 the new Hyundai uh, eGMP uh, electric vehicle platform that the Ionic Five is using. Um, and uh, you know, there's going to be it, with that. And that that platform is is designed with rear wheel drive in mind, with uh, you know all wheel drive capability. So um, we'll probably see a rear drive and all wheel drive versions of that. Um, but I I like the way it looks. It's uh, it's got that sloping front end, and then yeah, that really raked um, windshield. And the and the glass house that sort of tapers to the rear, um, and uh, sitting above like a really chunky body, um, really tall doors, uh, really high belt line. Yeah, it's you know to my mind it's another good looking Kia, um, with it's really and kind of squat and wide proportions seemingly, and uh, they uh, wrap around. Taillights 
that then turn down as you go, as you come around the side, yeah. and then they meet that um, sort of rocker panel trim piece that sweeps up, and it sort of virtually connects through where the wheels are, through where the rear uh, wheel arch is. Very interesting, very cool detailing, uh, but like you say, not much um, information yet on you know mechanicals and capabilities. Um, but their styling, I think, continues to really uh, do well. Another good-looking Kia. That's a good way to put it. I think um, in some ways this could end up overshadowing the the Hyundai version on the same platform, which sometimes Kias do. They they tend to show up and they're like <laughs> they're like wearing the louder suit and the the cool hat, and then there's like the Hyundai, which is kind of like Telluride versus Palisade. Um, yeah. You know, we it's a little surprising how much we don't know about this car, considering it's you know we're we're suggesting it might go on sale as soon as this year even. Um, so it took me a minute there, John, but I see what you're talking about. I do see the roof line of the soul like resemblance there, but it mm. just, it's like a totally different vehicle. So I'm like, what's he talking about? This doesn't look like a soul, but yeah, I, I totally see it. And it's very attractive. It's a good looking car. Um, yeah. looks like it'll be a lot of fun to drive. So yeah, I mean, just the EV party is, I mean, it went from like, you know this like so like small elite like club to it's like a keg party right now and i think that's that's kind of great that's where we're where we're going should we spend some money yeah do it all yeah, right absolutely. let me uh this is a long question here it's a good one let me dial it up here all right so this one comes from colleen uh love this here because her boyfriend jacob actually wrote us uh in the last episode so we get to, uh, you know, do a little bit of, you know, help out this couple here. So that's great in back-to-back -back episodes. So uh, she currently drives a 2006 Honda Pilot EX. Um, she's looking for a new ride. Uh, here's the criteria. Uh, space, she's hauled everything from mattresses to three dogs. Uh, in the last nine years, she's moved four times. So needs a little bit of room here. Um, appreciates the flexibility with the shape of the vehicle, which is boxy. For this 06 pilot um also enjoyed having three rows even though she only used it uh just rarely reliability is important obviously a 2006 honda pilot is still running and it's up to 185,000 on the clock so that's a great thing uh probably means that there's at least some preference here for honda uh likes the v6 uh, let's see sunroof is a um, maybe even excuse me sunroof and leather seats are must-haves likes uh technology but wants it to be simple so um you know not some crazy complicated touch screen i hear you so the budget is uh about thirty thousand dollars would be willing to stretch up to 35 grand um just depending on what's out there uh, also is just kind of asking would it be better to buy newer or for fewer miles um a couple other things here um let's see the pilot's ac broke so we got to get this answered quickly and <laughs> here's what the field is she's looking at kia telluride honda passport uh atlas toyota forerunner grand cherokee uh 2015 honda pilot and she's also driven a mazda cx9 and a vw golf all uh, all track um even considered some mid-sizers like a mazda cx5 or a sorrento previous subaru owner as well as a honda civic okay i'm out of breath my voice is getting scratchy uh, I will throw it over to you, John, for your impressions. Well, uh, it sounds like um, a newer pilot would would uh, suit her quite well. Um, you know, if she likes sort of the simplicity of the interior and the utility of it, um, I think uh, you know the just staying with that nameplate would. Um, if it doesn't sound like she's sick of it, it just sounds like this one's, uh, you know, uh, lived a long and useful life. Um, so I think uh, that might be what I would do. She has some other, you know, interesting ones on it. The, the, the Kia Telluride we talked about. The, I mean, look at it. If you can, if you can find a, a, a used one in your in your price range, you can get a, a base one, uh, a base Telluride in that. Uh, price range but if you could find a used one um with maybe a little more content that might suit you better um and then um 
mentions the uh, Sorrento, which uh, which I really like. the 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 new Sorrento um, uh, starts uh, about thirty thousand, and um, gosh, it's really nice. It might not you know have quite the space, but it's 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 a spacious vehicle. I mean, it's uh, got a lot of room. Not quite as much as as maybe what she needs, but um, it depends on how often she needs to make use of all that space. Um, but honestly, I think sticking with, with, a, with a pilot and just uh, buying a newer one uh, would be a, a safe move. All right. Uh, we'll throw it around the horn to you, Joe. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, when people ask uh, for advice on a new car, I mean, the first thing I always say is like, what do you have now? And how come you don't want to just go get another one of those? And so for, in this case, you know, it seems like a, a, I mean, she's looking at kind of late model used probably, and she could get a late model pilot. It would do much of what she uh, is looking for, what, what, would do much of what she wants from her new car. So, but maybe she's like, she likes the square looking SUVs, like the list that she's given is some of the more squared off ones. And the newer pilot compared to her original version pilot, the, the first generation pilot is very squared off and utilitarian looking and actually pretty handsome act to my mind and in sort of a plainish kind of a way. But the newer one is, is a little more rounded and maybe a little larger. And maybe that's why she's kind of looking around for casting around for alternatives. Um, if if she's going 185,000 miles with basically just regular maintenance, that sets a pretty high bar for <laughs> reliability. Um, so one thing that I thought of that would meet that bar would be a Highlander. Uh, particularly, she could get a Highlander hybrid, which would improve on the fuel economy of her V6 pilot by quite a quite a large degree um it would be a little larger but not super huge i mean in in that class of vehicles like she also mentions the atlas the atlas is really really big uh it's at the larger end and the highlander is more in the medium or even medium smaller end so that's one that i would put at the top of the list to have her check out uh, yeah, a Telluride would be good also, but it's only been out, you know, for uh, not a long time. Yeah. So I don't know that there's going to be a lot of used ones there around. <laughs> they're, they're hard to find. I, I was looking, but there are a few out there, uh, but they seem to get snapped up pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly. And she mentions a forerunner, like liking the looks of those, but that's going to definitely get worse gas mileage than she's used to, although it would have the longevity for sure um and a grand cherokee you know would have that kind of utilitarian sort of straight edge kind of handsome styling that she seems to be fond of and would certainly have like kind of deluxe features that she was looking for but i don't know that i would predict 185,000 miles of trouble-free motoring uh from a grand cherokee let me a little more maintenance intensive so I think the top of my suggestion list would be a couple year old Highlander hybrid and look for a higher spec one to get uh, leather seats and a great big sunroof. You'd have to get used to a CBT though, which she says she doesn't want, but it might be worth the trade off. Honestly, the CBTs are, are, are getting better with every passing generation. Um, and yeah, well, if she didn't want a CVT, you could always go back and get the regular V6 version, um, which wouldn't be as economical, but still would probably be like a, a MPG or two ahead of a 2000, um, a pilot that's, you know, 15 years old. Yeah, in my mind, the CVT is worth the trade off, uh, but if, it depends on if that's a hard no for her. But because uh, I, I like I, I would go with that with the hybrid my, myself personally. It's an interesting um, way to look at it too. Yeah, not being totally sure how she like how hard of a no the CVT is. Um, you know, 
I guess, write us back. But a couple of my impressions here are, it seems like there's a bit of a preference for Honda. And I feel like sometimes when you read the spend my money questions, you can sort of almost like try to like read between the lines. So I will slightly <laughs> confirm, you know, I guess the bias here of saying, it sounds like maybe you do want a Honda Pilot, try and find a good late model one. And that could be one uh, of your options. Uh, the Passport is different than a Pilot. Um, so you might just want to take a look at that. I found that to be an interesting crossover. I'm honestly not sure if that would be the one. I mean, it probably wouldn't be the one I would personally get, but it's interesting. You might like it. It's a little bit of a different vibe than we generally see from Hondas. So, you know, check that out. That's, uh, right in the like 28 to like $35,000 range, depending on what year you want or how many miles you're willing to take. Uh, just looking at the auto blog listings here, there's a 2019 Passport EXL for $31,000. Uh, it's in Massachusetts, but, um, you know, they're out there. Uh, that kind of fits into that range. And then I would say, too, depending on, like, just where you're at, I would consider a Forerunner just because I really like Forerunners. Um, yeah, you know, cool. she mentioned that she likes the look of them. I mean, honestly, if that's where you're going, I would not steer you away from them. They're cool. They're fun. Um, reliable. You know, reliable. Run forever, but they'll run your gas, you know, your fuel economy forever too. So like you're definitely going a little bit into the past with that technology. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're cool. And I mean, honestly, that's why people buy cars. It can be a, a purchase where you just say, hey, this is what I want. So, I mean, if it were me, I would go drive a 4Runner too, just to kind of see if some of the compromises that you will get with a 4Runner are worth some of the modern amenities of those other two that are probably admittedly more practical on the list. So, um, yeah. Any final thoughts, guys? No, I'm, I'm just curious to see what she goes with. And uh, what what did you? Uh, what was the other car that you put in their driveway last week? Mm, I'd have to double check. I actually don't have that in front of me, um, but. I tell you what, Colleen and Jacob, please write us when you come up to a, a decision here. Um, we're excited to see uh, what you guys end up with. Um, yeah, we, take we our love the follow-up stories. Yeah, exactly. Take them. Don't take them. I actually really like it when sometimes people write in and say, well, you told me to do this, so I did the opposite. Awesome. Uh -huh. That's great. Sometimes just bouncing the idea off of somebody is really, is really quite helpful. But that's all the time we have this week. Joe, thanks for joining us. John, stay safe out there. Um, everybody, have a great weekend. Send us your spend my monies at podcast at autoblog.com. We'll see you next time.